Church. Welcome to Lakewood Presbyterian Church. I'm glad that you have come on this fourth Sunday of Easter, what we call Good Shepherd Sunday, and also Mother's Day. So I wish all of you a very, very happy Mother's Day and a very warm welcome. We gather inside this beautiful and sacred space each and every Sunday so that we can worship God in spirit and in truth and listen to the word and listen for the word that God will speak. So whether you arrive this morning as a child or a senior citizen or somewhere in between, know that you are welcome here. Whether you come with much or with little, a person of influence or someone who feels perhaps pushed to the margins of our culture, know that you are welcome here because God in Christ has already welcomed us. And whether your family is large or small, whether you are a mom or a dad, or whatever your family looks like, I hope that you know that here you are a part of a giant worldwide family called the family of God, the kingdom of God. And today, if you come looking for healing, happy or sad, certain or searching, I hope you know that you're welcome in these pews. We are all welcome as we come here on our journeys of life and faith. God welcomes all of us. So come, let us sing to the Lord and make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us worship and bow down before the Lord our Maker. We belong to Christ. Christ the Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Amen.
Son and our Lord Jesus, our Good Shepherd, has gathered us together again. Lord, help us today as the scriptures are read and proclaimed. Help us not to wander away from his flock, but follow where he leads us, listening for his voice, staying near to him, so that we will be safely and obediently within your fold. For all these things we pray for his sake, for your glory, in service to your kingdom of grace and peace. And together we say, Amen. You may be seated. Join me in our unison confession. Merciful God, sometimes we wander from your ways like lost sheep. We follow the devices and desires of our own hearts rather than your ways of compassion and service. We have left undone those things we ought to have done, and done the things we should have left alone. Help us to listen to your voice and respond to your high call. Forgive us and set us free to begin again through Jesus Christ our Lord. sisters, hear the good news. God sent Jesus into the world, not to condemn the world, but to heal, redeem, and save it. Be assured that we belong to Christ and trust his promise that God is full of grace and compassion and will forgive, restore, and set us free. Amen. Our first lesson comes from the book of Acts. Chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them back to Jerusalem. Now as he was going along and approaching Damascus, Suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuted. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, because they heard the voice, but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street named Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him, so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized and after, after taking some food, he regained his strength.
the festival of the de dedication was taking place in Jerusalem, it was winter time, and Jesus was there walking around in the temple in the portico of Solomon. And so the Jewish leaders gathered around him and they said to him, How long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, then just tell us. Jesus answered them, I have told you and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they testify about me. But you do not believe because you do not belong to my sheep. For my sheep hear my voice. I know them and they know me. I give them life eternal and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than anything else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand, for we are one. And then they took up stones to kill him. Jesus went away across the Jordan to that same place where John had once baptized earlier, and he stayed there. Many came to him, and all of them were saying, John did not perform signs, but everything that he said about this man was true. And many believed in him there. This is the gospel of Christ, and may his name be praised forever. Amen. Now may the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of all of our hearts together find acceptance in God's sight. I have lost track of all of the, the people who have reached out to me through the years because they wanted God uh, to speak to them. They wanted uh, an answer. They wanted some sort of reassurance. They wanted a, a divine finger to you know, point them in the way. And they came to me because they felt that their calls for help were falling on closed ears. And there have been just as many who have come to me with the same sort of issue, only a little bit different, experiencing what to them were uncomfortable, strange, weird nudges. Their, their minds, their souls were starting to get a little fixated on some issue, some concern, some idea, some vision. And even though they tried to shade off, they just couldn't do it. Most all of them were just humming along fine. And when all of a sudden they were overcome with a sense of disconnection. Their lives, they felt, had slipped away from whomever or, or whatever it was that was, was holding them together and sort of forming part of their, their identity, their sense of meaning, and even their, their life path. It was as if, you know, an existential monkey wrench had been thrown into the spokes of their lives and they just wanted to hear a message. They wanted to hear some divine message from outside of themselves. The most interesting and challenging of them have been people like me who come from a theological mindset of certainty. Certainty that is born of authority or authority figures. We hail from church traditions that hold the scriptures, all of them, from Genesis to Revelation, you know, in very, very high regard, almost as if every word in them was divinely dictated into the ears of some obedient scribe like Moses or Luke, or Paul, or John the Revelator. This happened to me over and over again. It's probably happened to some of you. Something happens. Something starts to unfold in our lives as we are walking merrily along that rubs up against 
maybe some of the spiritual and theological assumptions, perspectives, worldviews that we have been wrapped up in for years. And we just want to hear from the Lord. We just want to tell us straight up, what are we supposed to believe or do or think or say? Hoping, I think, in most cases, that it's not going to upturn too much of the soil of our lives for new things and, and new seeds that, well, might change us, change our perspective, open us to something new. Because I've learned after 33 years of ministry that most of us don't like change. Now, for those who actually read the Bible, they claim as their sole authority. Jesus' words here in John chapter 10 must be really frustrating, if not sometimes infuriating, when they are trying to hear uh, a word from heaven. You heard it. My sheep hear my voice. I know them. And they know me. That statement can be hard to stomach when you want a clear word, when you aren't hearing the word that you're hoping for or that you want to, to receive, when you need a certain and some sort of certainty to come to you. I say this. Because Jesus' statement surely infuriated the religious teachers who heard it first. In fact, John says they were so put off by it that they started picking up stones to bash his brains in. But Luke says he slipped away, you know, before they lobbed the first one. My guess is that most of us have stormed heaven's gates with requests for guidance, for a direction, for understanding, for answers, for clarity, and yes, for certainty. You know, we've got an issue on the table of our lives, and we want a clear, decisive, unambiguous answer. And sometimes we're hearing and we're feeling words and ideas and thoughts that come to us out of the blue and they upset our status quo, whatever it is. It upsets us. It threatens our certainties. It challenges our comfort zones. So much so that we just try to ignore it. We try to repress it. We dig in even deeper, all in an effort to resist course correction or to take, you know, that fork in the road down the way that might be the beginning of a new journey, a new path. And so, you know, in an effort to stay put, to know what we already know, we lob loaded prayers asking for confirmation of what we already think or what we have known, all of which help, I think, to just block what very well could be the Holy Spirit's nudgings, the Holy Spirit's inspiration and guidance, sort of like a spiritual call blocking. For all you Facebookers out there, unfriending, you know that? <clears throat> I'm not liking this message. You're done. A lot of that is going on now. We're not even willing to hear perhaps a different or broader perspective. I think that is exactly what was happening between Jesus and so many of those died in the world religious teachers and leaders of his day. My guess is that their status quo was the thing that was holding them together, you know, given the Roman occupation and religious oppression, 
and, and just their long-held convictions, their ancient convictions about their scriptures and Moses and all their traditions. They got in this theological hair pull, trying to accuse Jesus of blasphemy because he called God the Lord, Yahweh. He called God his Father. And then said that the signs and the wonders and the healings and the exorcisms and all of it, well, that was just the whole fingerprint of God. And they said, so when, when will you just stop holding this in suspense? The Greek's a little rusty. I just learned this week that one way to interpret that is, when are you going to stop annoying us? And just say it. Call yourself God. Even though we all know you're just a man. Then Jesus quoted one of their own Bible verses. Is it not written in Moses, I said you are God's little G? I think he was trying to show them that their rules of biblical interpretation, all their convictions and their belief patterns about scripture, their scripture at the time, were inconsistent. And they had just proof texted their ideas, their assumptions about God for too long. Think about it, Jesus never stopped upsetting their theological avatar. Our Bible says an eye for an eye tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not return evil for evil. Moses gave permission for a man to throw a wife away. I say a wife because they could have multiple wives back then. So much for family values. To, to throw a wife to the curb. But I say to you, anyone who does that for no reason is the one who is committing adultery. Maybe what 
sounds to us like the silence of heaven or divine indifference. Maybe what's really going on is our resistance, our call blocking, our own unwillingness to hear anything except what we want to hear, what we always believe, what we have always thought, what has always brought us comfort and certainty. And what about those, those, those nudges, those dreams, those thoughts, those yearnings, those interior, interior whistles that we can't seem to shake, even if we cover our ears, close our minds, dig in our feet. What about those things? Well, they could well be the voice of God, the voice of Good Shepherd, who knows our names and only wants the best for us, which probably might look different than what already is. We just can't see it, and some of us just don't want to. Scripture says Paul heard the voice after he had persecuted the followers of Jesus. Boy, did he hear it. It knocked him off of his horse. It blinded his hardened eyes, closed off his narrow world view and all of his religious certainty, his hard-hearted ways. Saul, Saul, why are you doing this? Who, who is this? It's Jesus, the one you are persecuting. Now stand up and go into the city and there you will be told what to do next from a human voice, which is also the way God sometimes speaks to us. Next thing you know, Saul was all ears and with, within a few days, he was proclaiming Jesus and the good news that he brought to the world. And as you know, Saul became Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, all because his world, his life, his perspective, his theology was turned in over in when he finally opened up his heart, his soul, and his ears to listen. All of it because he had the good sense to do it. He had the good sense to listen to one who called him by name and wanted only God's very best, like the best mother or father any of us could imagine, all of whom, I think I'm safe to say, told us things we did not want to hear. Now, speaking as your earthly mortal under shepherd, I've been trying to listen to this voice for a long time, and I'm getting a little better at it, I think. But I need to tell you something, and I hope this comforts you. The voice I hear almost never speaks in words that come through my ears, but this I know. Hardly a day goes by that the chief shepherd's voice doesn't speak to my heart. And I don't always understand the meaning of every event or experience that unfolds in my life or in the world. I do not always hear what I wanted to hear what I was hoping to hear. But if I stop resisting, remove the call block, call block, friend, friend him again, however you guys do that, the message restores my soul 
leads me in the green pastures and besides calmer waters. My sheep listen for my voice. They know me. And I know them. I'm going to close with what I think is one of the most beautiful Psalm 23 shepherd prayers I know. Let us pray. Loving shepherd of thy sheep, guide thy lambs and in thy safety keep. For nothing can thy power withstand and nothing can pluck us from thy hand. Loving shepherd, ever near, teach thy lambs thy voice to hear. And at last, before our Father's throne, we shall know as we are known.
of space and time, the Alpha and Omega, who calls to us from the whirlwind. Like Job, we approach you as infinite mystery. Even when we feel your loving embrace, there is much we humbly accept we do not know. And we can do little but open our arms to this grand journey with wonder, fear, and hope. Wonder takes hold of us when we consider that there is anything at all, that the grand creation is as beautiful from the farthest galaxy to the summer flower blossoming before our eyes. We marvel at the turning of the seasons, the budding of new relationships and reunions, new rhythms of rest and renewal that it brings, slowly making their way into our lives after time of great public distress. And somehow now we appreciate the grandness of small gestures and pleasant everyday moments we once took for granted. The wonder leads us to gratitude. But if we are honest, fear also abides with us. We know there are sick people who need healing. We pray for those in our congregation who need your special tender touch. Carol, Judy, Jim Myers, Grace, Georgiana, Gloria, and those in our hearts who we work, watch or tend to care for. We see a pandemic that has taken so many lives unexpectedly and diminished the sense of common good and goodwill. We see greed leading us to take more than we need from the earth and our neighbors. We witness too many go hungry or lack housing or dignified work. We find the grieving among us carrying many untold burdens. We hear the cries from our streets for those slain and their loved ones. We know there are great dangers that surround us in these times and how precariously we trod. We ask for your peace and reconciliation in wars around the world. Not only the Ukraine, but Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Mexico, Somalia, Libya, Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, and the Kurdish and Turkey. But we do know this. You put compassion in our hearts to tend to the vulnerable and aggrieved and isolated. You give us wisdom and knowledge through which we can respond to the crises of health and politics and violence in our midst. You give us courage with which to approach with hope the neighbors we don't know and those for whom we carry suspicion. All we need is the will to follow your will. This is the prayer we raise up to you in the name of Jesus, who taught his disciples to face the wonder and fear, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. Holy God, we rejoice that the grave could not hold Jesus, that he conquered death, and that he has risen to rule over all the powers of this earth and life. We give you thanks that he continues to summon us into new life upon new pathways and journeys. Help us to listen and to follow him with joy and willingness and with gladness. We praise you for his presence with us, and because he lives, we too shall live. Thanks be to you for all of your good gifts and graces. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
in peace, having courage, holding on to what is good, returning no one evil for evil. But we go forth, listening for the shepherd's voice, straightening the faint-hearted, supporting the weak, helping people who are suffering. Let us remember to love God above all else, to love our neighbors, and to see in, in them, the image and the likeness of the one true God. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the chief shepherd of our souls, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us forever.